Well, everyone, we are doing module 8 on synchronization. This is lecture number 2, where we are going to discuss implementation of these atomic instructions, that is the uninterruptible instructions, which we discussed in the previous lecture. We will uh, get a feel of how they get implemented at the hardware level. Okay, so the first one we are going to consider is the test and set. So test and set is an uninterruptible instruction which goes to the memory, checks the lock variable. If that variable is free, it will set it to 1. That is if the variable is 0, that is the lock is free, it goes and writes a 1 into that location, that is it seals the lock or obtains the lock. Okay, so test and set as the two words says we are actually doing two memory operations. One is a read that is the test and second set is the write operation. So when I am doing two write operations, how do we make them atomic? Because between the read and the write anything can happen. Okay, so uh, one solution for doing this is uh, for example in a bus based system when we go out for doing the test that is we acquire the bus for the test we do not release the bus until the set has completed. Okay, so you do not release the bus uh, once you get the bus grant before you finish both these operations. The second option is you can uh, to begin with acquire exclusive access on the data item because the test is a read. So you would normally get a read uh, shared access and for setting you would need a write permission. Right, So instead of asking for permission twice, you could directly ask for a write exclusive permission for that data block. So you get the block in exclusive mode, do the read and then do the write. And while doing this, uh, this is all right for an atomic bus, but if you have a split transaction bus, then uh, not releasing the bus is going to create problems or uh, create or complicate more uh, deadlock considerations. So not releasing the bus is not a good option, hence holding the block in exclusive mode is a better option. Okay, So the two options we are going to consider is do not release the bus until both operations are completed. This is alright for an atomic bus, but it is difficult for a split transaction bus. Why? Because it may lead to deadlock. The second approach is if you have invalidation based uh, write back caches, that is invalidation based cache coherence protocol with write back caches, obtain the block in exclusive ownership. Okay, so go uh, and demand the block in exclusive mode. Once you have block in exclusive mode, perform both the read and the write. So do the read and the write and only then release the block. In the meanwhile, if transactions come in the atomic bus, no issue, but in a split transaction bus, suppose you have got the block in exclusive uh, access, you finish the read, but before you could do the write, a new request from another process comes for the same block. So what should we do? Should we relinquish the block? So we do not because this is an atomic instruction which we want to execute. Hence any incoming requests for the same block onto the bus need to be buffered. So you do not knack them, you simply buffer the request, first finish your write and then uh, service to that request by updating the data block or deleting the data block at this end. Okay, so this is how we can maintain atomicity of this test and set instruction. A similar idea holds for the other two instructions. So the other two instructions fetch and op and compare and swap. So fetch and op uh, we have earlier considered the fetch and increment version which goes fetches the data, increments the value by 1 n then writes the data back. Okay, So it is similar, so we can say if you have to do the same things as we did for test and set in the previous slide. So what were the options? Acquire the bus, do not release the bus before you do both the operations or get the block in exclusive mode, complete the operation and then write. The only difference here is the operation which you want to do, if it is increment, decrement or any operation that might take a little longer than the test and set because test and set only sets the value whereas uh, fetch and op may do other operations also. The third one compare and swap. So compare and swap actually is slightly complicated because it needs three operands because it is going to compare the memory location. So it needs the lock where the lock variable some register say R2 to compare with. So we are going to compare these two whether they are equal or whatever is the comparison uh, condition for us. And once the test passes, 
the comparison test passes, what are we going to do? We are going to swap the lock variable with another register okay, or swap it with for example, an absolute value of 50 say. Okay, so here I am going to need three operands, uh, three operands, one is the lock variable, one is the register to compare and third is the register or value to be swapped. So when there are three operands for a memory instruction, this would become difficult implementation for risk based systems, whereas this is good enough for CISC based machines. Okay, so this is how these three operations get implemented. To get a feel of how they interact with the cache coherent system, we will do one small example. Okay, So here we are going to do an exercise of implementing or seeing how this atomic operation is executed for the exchange in, uh, instruction. So this exchange instruction is similar to the test and set or swap instruction. So essentially we want to go read a value and then exchange it with a new value. So first read and then write the value. So go test the variable and then set the variable. Okay. So in a cache coherent system to implement exchange we discussed in the previous lecture that instead of directly doing exchange we want to loop on a locally cached copy and if the locally cached copy says that the lock variable is available only then you execute the exchange which is writing to that variable. So when I am going to loop onto a locally cached copy there is going to be the cache coherent system coming into play. Okay, so our example will have suppose I have three processes and all three of them intend to acquire lock on the lock variable. So everybody would uh, do a spinning on the local cached copy. So they will acquire the lock in their local caches and then check for the lock. If the lock is free one of them will try to set it. To begin with let us assume the lock is already acquired by process P0. P0 is holding the lock, it is yet to write one to that lock and the other two processes also want to do the same thing. But when they try to read the lock variable in their local cached copies, they will see that the lock is equal to one, that is somebody has already acquired the lock. So they would incur a cache miss because when the P0 does an exchange instruction, it is going to invalidate the local copies of P1 and P2. So these copies will get invalidated. P0 will finish its exchange, that is the right operation. After that, both of these will again go into their loop of spinning on the local cached copy. Now this spinning on the local cached copy is a read operation. The block was invalidated because of P0. So they will load the block again and they may find the block uh, to be equal to 1 or 0 depending on whether P0 has released the lock or not. Okay, So this is the scenario we are going to discuss slowly one by one. You can pause the video in the middle to uh, see whether you are following it and you can also derive it for yourself before you continue with the video. Okay, So let us do the example. So I am assuming P0 already has the lock that is the lock variable is equal to 1. So lock is the lock variable I am using. It is already equal to 1 because P0 is using it and P, P2 and P1 want to acquire the lock. Uh, the, the, in this attempt P2 wins when both of them tries and then P1 has to again go into the busy wait for doing this. Okay, So I am assuming a cache based synchronization for a write invalidate uh, protocol. Lock is with P0, P1, P2 parallelly try to lock it, P2 wins and P1 keeps spinning. Okay, So this is a big chart. So let us do it slowly one by one. It is uh, not uh, difficult, it is uh, fairly simple because now you understand cache coherence and hence following this will not be difficult. Okay, so the first column is just keeping track of the number of steps. These are 8 steps, so I would say they are more abstract because in real implementations you might need more number of rows. But overall, these are the eight major steps which will take place. Okay, so let us start with the first row that is step number one. Step number one says that P0 already has the lock. Okay, we have started with this uh, scenario. And P1 and P2 want to uh, acquire the lock. And to acquire the lock, if you recollect, we had the uh, assembly code which we discussed yesterday. Uh, what did it do? It did a read. I'm just writing an abstract version. So you have to read the lock and branch if not equal to what was it? If lock is one, 
So, if it should be branch if equal to not equal to 0, yeah. So, if branch if not equal to 0, keep on reading until uh, the log becomes 0. So, if branch uh, if log is 1, that is it is not 0, keep on looping uh, on your local cached copies, okay. So, once you do this and you come out of this loop, you have to make the log variable equal to 1. Okay, so, this is the uh, overall idea which is going to take place. So, P1 and P2 are in this loop. They are spinning onto their cached variables and checking if the lock is equal to 0. They are in this uh, read and branch if not equal to 0 condition. So, when P1 and P2 read, what is the state of this cache block? It is with P1, it is with P2 because once they start reading, they will encounter cache misses and once p1 p2 do a read they get a cache miss this goes on to the bus or to the directory eventually the request will go to p0 because p0 is holding the lock in exclusive uh, mode so p0 relinquishes the exclusive permission and it gives the updated value of lock onto the bus now this lock value was made equal to 1 right so here when i say has lock the lock value is equal to 1 with p0 once the misses of P1 and P2 go onto the bus, P0 is going to give the lock value equal to 1 to the memory and it will come to both P1 and P2. So, the shared, uh, the status of the lock variable is shared and it is with all three processes. All three of them have the lock variable. It is set to 1 by P0 and P1 and P2 see it as 1. So, when they see it as 1, what will happen? They will continue in this loop. Right? So, they will continue in this loop which you can see read and branch if not equal to 0. So, P1, P2 are in that loop. Okay. Now, uh, P0 which had the lock, it decides that it has finished the, using the lock and it wants to set it to, uh, it wants to set the lock to 0. Now, P0 wants to set the lock to 0 that is it executes the unlock instruction that is a store lock with value of 0. It is a store instruction which goes as an exclusive or write instruction onto the uh, coherent interconnect that is the bus or the directory. This is going to generate invalidations. Why? Because if P0 wants to write to the lock, it will generate invalidations for P1 and P2. When invalidations happen, the block is removed. So, I delete the lock from here, I delete the lock from here. And where is the lock variable? It is exclusively with P0. So, lock is with P0, okay. So, as you follow this video, you can keep track of what is happening. You can slowly build the same idea in your notebooks. So, say step 2 is completed. Now, end of step 2, P1 and P2's block is removed. Well, they are still doing this loop, read lock and branch if not equal to 0. So, when they go there, the read lock, what will happen to read lock? It will result into a cache miss for both of them. So, both of them want to read the lock and the lock was removed by P0, so they incur a cache miss. What will they do? They go on to the bus and say, I want the block. Suppose P2's cache miss or P2 wins in getting the bus, it gets the bus and gets the lock, okay. So, P2 wins the bus and acquires the lock variable. P1 also wanted the lock variable, but it did not get the bus. So, it has to wait for the bus or the directory because right now P2 is using the bus. The next clock cycle or the next bus transaction, P1 will succeed and it will be able to go and get a copy of the lock variable. If you see end of step 2, the value of lock is 0. So, when P2 gets the lock, the value here will be 0. So, I will just say here at this moment value of lock is 0 and in the first line value of lock was equal to 1. Line number 4 lock is 0, P2 sees lock 0, line number 5 P5 also sees lock 0. Now, both of them see lock equal to 0, okay. So, satisfied does not go into this loop, so we are here. So, right now both the processes are in this portion where they want to set the lock, that is they want to exchange a 1 with the lock variable. So, we are going to do the exchange instruction or the write instruction. Both P1 and P2 want to do this instruction. Okay. So, we are now at step number 5 where P1 has got the lock and uh, parallelly 
P2 wants to uh, start writing. So, it executes the swap instruction. When it executes the swap, which is the write instruction, what will happen? It is going to generate a bus transaction for write, which will invalidate the block of P0 and P1. If P0 is still holding it, it has to be uh, removed from P0 as well as from P1. So, P2's cache miss will generate invalidates and the lock will be now exclusively given to P2 because P2 wants to write and it has uh, won the bus. Now, P2 got the right to lock and it writes lock equal to 1 here. Okay. Now, in the meanwhile, P1's uh, also wanted to execute the swap instruction. Okay, these are happening concurrently. P2 got the lock 0, P1 got the lock 0. P2 executes the write, P1 executes the write. Both of them wanted to execute the write. Okay, so consider here, this is P2 wanted to do the swap and P1 also wanted to do the swap. Okay, both of these instructions have gone and uh, the swap as you see is an exclusive atomic instruction. P2 acquires the bus, it completes the swap and then it releases it. So, when P1 tries to execute its swap, that is when this executes, what is going to happen? It is going to see the latest copy written by P2 because end of this, if I say end of this, what is going to happen? The value of lock will be equal to 1 due to P2. Okay, so P2 has executed the swap and it made the value of lock equal to 1. In the meanwhile, P1 executes the swap. So, when P1 executes the swap, what will it see? Its swap completes and it sees the lock variable to be equal to 1. Okay, So, P1 when it does the swap, it sees the lock variable equal to 1 because P2 has recently made it equal to 1. So, what should it do? It goes back to spin testing again until the lock value becomes 0. Okay, So, here first P2 got the exclusive access. Later on, P1 will eventually get the exclusive access for the lock and they will complete. Okay, So, this is uh, how a locally spinning copy or a cached copy can be used for first doing the testing and when you finish the test, you try to swap. Okay, So, that is an interplay between synchronization, atomic instructions and a cache coherent uh, directory or a snooping based protocol. Okay, So, for a clean understanding, I have made another copy of the same table in this slide. Right, uh, so I hope that was uh, clear. So, we have uh, studied how to implement atomic instructions. The third one was implementing the LL and SC instruction. LL was load link, SC was store conditional. So, this was uh, another variety of implementing uninterruptible instructions, but this is not a single instruction, this is a pair of instructions. And we also discussed that this pair succeeds together. I mean, if LL finishes or SC finishes alone, we do not declare that the lock was acquired. When both of them succeed, the lock was acquired. Okay, So, um, assume a process uh, executed the LL load instruction and it has to do some more instructions in the middle and then it does the store conditional. Sure. So, we have a LL and then a few instructions and then we do the SC. So, what we discussed is the internal instructions which are happening, they may or may not happen atomically. Uh, or at the same time in that same processor. It is very likely that the process may get rescheduled or reordered and so these intermediate instructions uh, are not guaranteed to complete one after the other. Hence, the LL and the SC are again not guaranteed to finish immediately, Okay, one after the other. It is possible that something else gets scheduled in the middle. So, if something else gets scheduled in the middle, the store condition should not succeed because it is likely that process P1 got the LL and in the meanwhile, before P1 could do the SC, P2 succeeded in doing the LL and SC at its own end Okay, because both of them are doing this in parallel. So, how should P1 know that P2 came in the middle and has already acquired the lock? So, this is the thing we are going to understand that after finishing the LL, before you do the store conditional, the store conditional instruction should itself be able to identify whether some other instruction has already succeeded in acquiring the lock. When would this happen? If some other process tries to write to the same variable. Okay. So, in a cache coherent system with the same shared variable, what will happen? If a process does a store conditional, 
that store is kind of a right instruction it is going to generate invalidates it is going to have some kind of a uh, transaction going onto the bus or to the directory so the system will know that another process is trying to access this variable so when i know this information can i tell this information to everybody that this variable was changed okay so that is what uh, we are going to exploit so when another process tries to write to this variable that address will be broadcasted and the previous process for example p1 in our case p1 has to keep track that in the middle before ll and sc between ll and sc if something else has happened i should know that somebody has changed for that we are going to use the concept of a flag so there will be a flag variable in case somebody changes that uh, lock variable this flag will be reset otherwise it will remain set so between ll and sc if there is a change by another process the flag resets otherwise the flag remains one okay so that's the overall idea of how ll and sc gets implemented okay so let's uh, see it properly now okay so every processor which has a cache has got two extra variables the first variable is called the lock flag and the second variable is called the lock address lock flag is a single bit lock address is to going to store the address of the ll instruction so suppose i say l lo load link uh, r2 with say address 500 so i'm going to write 500 inside this register and when i do ll i'm going to set this flag to 1 okay so uh, this is when ll happens later when sc takes place SC has to check whether the flag is still one because in the meanwhile if some other process tries to access the location 500 it will come and make this flag equal to zero okay so uh, this way SC will fail if the flag is zero because somebody else reset it if flag is still one it succeeds okay that's the overall idea okay uh, so let us say p2 does the ll so p2 executes the load linked instruction on the address 200 so what it does it puts the flag equal to 1 and the address in the lock address register so it puts these two things when it finishes the ll instruction after this uh, it is going to do some internal instructions maybe uh, other processes are also executing something and eventually p2 gets a chance to do the sc instruction so when p2 executes store conditional what should it do it comes and checks the flag is the flag equal to one if flag is one all right because there was no tampering for this address after p2 did ll there was no process which tried to access 200 hence the flag remained one and so the sc instruction succeeds and p2 is able to acquire the lock so if flag is zero it fails in this case flag was equal to one so we succeed in doing the sc instruction end of this p2 acquires the lock okay so p2 acquires the lock because i could uh, finish this pair of instructions so this pair was a success okay now we'll see another example where we may not get success same scenario p2 runs the ll it makes the flag 1 and address 200 okay it is yet to in, it is yet to execute the sc instruction but in the meanwhile p3 comes into picture and it wants to do ll or some access or it wants to execute sc anything related to address 200 so when p3 accesses the variable 200 it will send an invalidation uh, request for this address onto the bus now when this invalidation request is broadcast onto the bus what should uh, the system do it checks this 200 it sees that the invalidation is coming on 200 my lock variable has the address 200 hence i need to reset the flag why because somebody else is trying to read the address 200 and p2's llsc pair is not going to succeed hence it changes this flag variable to zero okay so it resets the flag variable to zero why because the address is matched okay end of this p3 uh, has acquired the address 200 because it invalidated it in the meanwhile p2 executes the sc when it go, executes sc it comes and checks the flag well the flag is zero so it concludes that somebody has 
use the address 200 hence I cannot succeed in acquiring the log because flag is 0 SC instruction results into a failure. So this LLSC pair fails and P2 again retries ok. So it has to try again the LLSC pair because this current execution of the pair did not succeed ok. So what are the cases when the flag will get reset right here I showed you one scenario when P3 tried to write to the variable 200 and we had to reset the flag because the LL and SC pair should happen uninterrupted because this pair together is acting as a atomic instruction or a pair of uninterruptible instructions. Even if there are multiple instructions in the middle, if somebody else tampers with that address, the second instruction will fail. If nobody tampered, the second instruction succeeds. So we need to take care of all the scenarios where the tampering has happened. Okay, this tampering is in a positive sense because somebody else has used the variable. Um, so it's not a th security threat, but it is a correctness issue. So we have three cases when the flag will get reset. Okay, the first one is the flag gets reset on any invalidation or update which goes onto the bus. This is the example we saw in the previous slide. So any invalidation or update onto the bus for this address is going to reset the flag. The second situation is that the current processor here P2, P2 itself deletes the address 200 from its cache. It may happen that uh, between LL and SC after finishing LL the cache of P2 had to delete the address 200. So if address 200 is not in the cache there is no point in doing the SC. Hence any evictions from P2 will also result in resetting the flag. Okay, So this, so when the block is replaced in the cache, the processor is no longer holding the block, it is no longer going to see any invalidations on that address, hence it resets the flag. The third case is on context switch. So context switch is this process, particular process executing the LL was moved out and some other process was scheduled by the processor. So when a context switch uh, happens, the uh, it may happen that the store condition of another process may succeed because of your homework, right? So we did this uh, flag equal to one for address 200 and, and some process was running on this pink processor. Another process runs on the same processor and if it executes the SC on the same address, it may succeed whereas it should not because that process never executed the LL. So the LLSC pair has to be process specific. Okay, so it has to belong to that same process and context switch is going to change the process. Hence, whenever context switch happens, we are going to reset the flag. Okay. So overall, when SC is executed, we have to check the flag variable. If it is 0, we fail. If it is 1, we succeed. That's how the LLSC pair is implemented. Okay, so this is uh, fine. Only thing we need to take care of two live log situations. One is that uh, if the cache replaces the block holding the lock variable. So this is, we had this LL on address 200 and we had some gap here and then we do the SC. So in the middle, if this address is evicted, if you evict this data block from the cache, then you would again need to load it. Again, maybe there is uh, some reason why the block gets uh, removed because of uh, cache conflict misses, okay. So, to avoid this, we should make sure that it is good to have split instruction and data caches or have a set associative cache so that the addresses we are using stay in the cache for a longer duration. So we can avoid live lock using that. Another situation is when I have two processes on different processors, uh, P1 and P2, both of them execute LL and then both of them uh, try to do the store conditional and they both end up invalidating each other's blocks. No, none of them succeeds. Both of them again go to the LL. Okay. So this pair keeps on going without uh, any process succeeding. So thus we have a like block in that case. Okay. So see this we have P1 and P2 as two processes. P1 executed the load link. I'm using an abstract notation LL 200. So I haven't uh, written the register as such, but it uh, P1 executes LL, P2 executes LL then P1 executes the store conditional because of this uh, P2's block gets invalidated. Then P2 says I want to do the SC or LL. So it uh, does this LL and then uh, so it may invalidate 
the block of P1 before P1 succeeds. So uh, it may happen that the block keeps happening a ping pong effect between P1 and P2 leading to a live lock situation. So how do you solve this live lock? So the first one uh, is simple that you make sure that the block remains in the cache for a longer duration and for the second scenario of the block uh, moving between P1 and P2 what we should do is the SC instruction should not be treated as a normal write instruction. See here when this SC happened it invalidated this block when this SC happens it will invalidate this block okay. So uh, SC if you see here this SC it may or may not succeed. So if the SC succeeds then all right, but if the SC does not succeed because the flag was 0 and you executed the SC, what will happen? Other copies will get unnecessarily removed from the system. So this unnecessary invalidations on failure of SC has to be solved. So you did SC and SC fails, but this SC has already gone onto the bus. Because it gone onto the bus, it has invalidated other copies. Other copies have removed and our SC instruction failed because our flag was 0. So this was an unnecessary futile exercise. So why did we do this? So this was unnecessary which may lead to more live lock uh, scenarios. Hence we should not treat SC as a normal write instruction. Okay. So we need to give some special treatment to this instruction and it says that in case your SC succeeds that is if your flag is equal to 1 that is when you are actually going to do the right. If your flag is 0 you are not going to perform the right. So if flag is 0 you have failed your SC pair and hence return do not do anything do not perform the store instruction. But if your flag is 1 only then you perform the right and only then invalidations will take place. Okay. So SC is treated as a special write instruction it will generate the write only when the flag condition is satisfied. Okay. So I hope with this uh, you have got a feel that how LL and SC gets executed and how we can solve the live log situations. So with this we have seen implementations of these uninterruptible instructions. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.